When Darth Vader was about to kill Master Eeth Koth, he told the Zabrak that he could sense the Jedi was full of fear and anger. And Koth's response was, quote, Perhaps it's the Zabrak in me. And thousands of years earlier, Revan was told that the Zabrak will, quote, Keep hacking at a fallen foe even after death, mutilating the corpse out of pure bloodlust. What's up, meta-nerds? This video will cover the Zabraks. Everything from their biology, culture, history, and how you get the Iridonian and Dathomirian Zabrak, and look at members that change galactic history, covering all of the lore from both legends and canon. So let's learn more about the violent history of this wild species. But before we do, I want to talk about a very violent and wild mobile game, Raid Shadow Legends. This game found the perfect spot of being just as complex as you want it to be, and simple enough to have features like the auto button that will pick the best combinations of attacks from your team. This makes jumping into the game a lot less overwhelming than some other team-based RPGs. The graphics are insane, and whatever goes into making a person feel attached to their character, they've mastered it. Because my fiance Elise was also playing on my account as well, and we quickly found ourselves debating the merits of our champions, creating our own teams that focused on different buffs and types of attack. My favorite is this two-sword-wielding love child of Xerxes and Braveheart, and hers is this lame who admittedly does dish out some pretty vicious beatdowns. I'm having the most fun with the dungeons, which all have their own specializations and loot drops, and end with these epic boss battles. They get really intense as you watch your team eke out an adrenaline-inducing close victory, or motivating as you see that you are just a few tweaks away. When you are defeated, you can head over to the tavern to upgrade. There you get an awesome opportunity to partake in some human, elf, dwarf, orc, or lizard folk sacrificing, using some of those lower level characters to strengthen up your favorite champions. It's really addicting and a lot of fun, and this month is the best time to jump in. They have this new Champion Fragments feature where you can unlock parts for the powerful Krayla Witch, and the new Bazaar where you can turn gold bars into all sorts of useful items, and you can even unlock champions just for logging in. Support the channel by downloading via the links below, and get a special welcome pack that has 50,000 silver, 50 gems, 5 mystery shards, those are really important, 1 energy refill, 1 day XP boost, and 1 clan boss key, also very important, and this beautiful, nightmare-inducing champion named Executioner. So be sure to get all that by checking out the links below. But let's get back to one of the greatest warrior races of the Star Wars universe by heading down to their homeworld of Iridonia. Located at coordinates J7 on the galactic map, within the mid-rim, it was a centrally located world, sitting on the lucrative Coruscant Dantooine hyperlane. The conditions here were horrible, pools of acid and even whole acid seas, with the land being rocky with harsh winds, but the deep canyons contained land that was hospitable to give rise to various life forms. But the Zabrak did not evolve naturally. They were created by the Rakata of the Infinite Empire. More specifically, their genome was crafted by the Mother Machine. I am Ashala, the Mother Machine. My children are as numerous as the Rakata once were. I called them Twi'lek, Zabrak, Eshka. An AI that was responsible for answering the question, why are the Rakata losing their connection to the Force? This was a race that grew great power from the dark side of the Force, but over the millennia of the Infinite Empire, this ability was leaving them. The few Force sensitives that remained tasked this AI with figuring out what could be done from the biological side, perhaps early research into midichlorians, and decided that to experiment, they should incarnate several different types of sentient beings. All of them are humanoid, or maybe it's more accurate to say rakatanoid in shape, with two arms, two legs, and a head which contains a mouth and sensory organs. They would have a similar height of 1.8 meters, or 5 feet 9 inches, and similar lifespans averaging 80 years. These species were seeded onto their homeworlds around 30,000 BBY, and the Zabrak would quickly become the dominant species on Iridonia, due to their intelligence, violence, and biological hardiness. The most striking feature were the horns on their head. These shrunk in size over the tens of thousands of years, but at the time that they were planted on Iridonia, they would have been much larger. At a time that biologists believed these would have been used for both offense and defense, these were likely used for combat for social dominance and for securing mates, since the male horns still do grow to be much longer than the females, as the males would engage in fights to the death in order to propagate their genes. And they're still seen on the modern Zabrak, and really start growing significantly once they hit puberty around 12 years old. And by using this x-ray of Master Eeth Koth, we can see that they are bones that grow directly out of their skull. These horns would grow in a variety of different patterns, length, and even number. As for diet, they were all carnivorous, so no Naboo wheatgrass for these folks, and they also possessed two hearts, providing more rapid and thorough oxygenation of the blood when vigorously engaged either running away from threats or when locked in a fight. This ability is literally superhuman and would exhaust countless human combatants over the millennia. 
The harsh conditions on Iridonia also made them relatively less receptive to pain than most species, and their natural predators here were remarkably deadly, honing all the Zabrak into fiercely combative people. Almost all Zabrak would take on facial tattoos during a rite of passage to adulthood, which often indicated their family and region, but some were just chosen by the individual to represent something personal to them. As you might expect, their early civilizations were extremely aggressive, and though they would become more peaceful as their technology and culture became more advanced, this past left a permanent mark on their temperament. As many species regarded most Zabrax to be arrogant at best, and murderous at worst, but no one ever called them dumb brutes. Their people had already traveled outside of their solar system tens of thousands of years before the Battle of Yavin, taking less than 5,000 years to go from being spawned by the Rakata to having their own little colonial empire in five different solar systems. It was at this point that the Duros discovered them, and likely where the species was introduced to the Hyperdrive, the miracle tech that opened them up to the rest of the galaxy. These savvy traders understood that Iridonia was a prime location as a midway point between Coruscant and the Outer Rim, and the dictatorship that ruled Zabrak was quick to make a trade agreement. This brought prosperity to their world, including imports from everything to exotic foods to high tech, that helped to raise their capital city of Maladris to the level of the galaxy's most advanced civilizations. Here, many would slowly lose their native Zabraki language, in favor of the universal language of Galactic Basic. But this all came at a grave cost. War. Horrifying reports from the Outer Rim seem to portend the utter destruction of the Republic. The first would be in the year 3996 BBY. These fallen Jedi would set the galaxy ablaze, with their fierce Mandalorian allies terrorizing colonies throughout the Outer and Mid Rims. Of all wars in Republic history, the war with the Mandalorians was the bloodiest. As one war bled into another, resulting in decades and then centuries of war, with only small breaks in between. The Mandalorian warriors were infamous for their brutality, and by this time the number of Zabrak colonies were growing exponentially. They quickly found they were no match for the Mandalorians. But the Zabrak did love a good fight, and those biological advantages mentioned earlier did help them to earn some victories. We get a first-hand account of this from the incredible engineer Bal Dur. I remembered when word of the Mandalorian attacks arrived on Iridonia. My people had colonies across the Outer Rim. Many of them were among the first systems to fall. I hated them. I wanted to destroy them. To give them the mercy they gave the people they conquered. Victories were rare, but we celebrated every Mandalorian's death. That loss of control blinded me, turned me into a weapon. This Zabrak was also a Jedi, serving under Mitra Surik during the Mandalorian War, and was who designed, constructed, and activated the Mass Shadow Generator. This war would also see the invasion of Iridonia, where the Mandalorians actually captured the entire planet. Though it should be noted that some Zabrak chose to join their clans, the Mandos always willing to take in any beings that wished to live through conquest, and who lived by the Mandalorian Codes of Honor. But for most Zabrak, because the Republic was the one fighting off the Mandos and who eventually liberated Iridonia, millions of them rushed to enlist with the Republic Armed Forces. After his creation, the Mass Shadow Generator destroyed Malachor V and ended the Mandalorian Wars, Baldur would go on with Mitra Surik to find lost Jedi Masters and help to rebuild the Jedi Order. And this era also saw Jedi Master Kal Sindarach, who held the rank of Battlemaster during the Great Galactic War of 3681. His Padawan would become one of the most important and powerful Jedi in the history of the Order, Satil Shan. Both witnessed firsthand the return of the Sith Empire, the Dark Order that was once thought vanquished had returned, and Blitzkrieged Korriban. In this opening battle of another decade of war, Darach would be killed in saber combat with Lord Vindikin and Malgus, a move that did help ensure that Shan could escape. So it's obvious that the Rakatan experiment to see if they could engineer some deeply Force-sensitive creatures seems to have worked. And though their appearance may have been scary to some other species, and their pugnacious and arrogant attitudes may have made you think that they would be on the bad guy side, we see these Iridonian Zabrax were mostly light side wielding Jedi, or warriors fighting for the Republic. But the years that followed would see an increase in mercenaries, and darker influences on Dathomir. The combination of Iridonian trade wealth, colonial interests to protect, and their fighting spirit gave a natural rise to Zabrak mercenaries. In a previous age, their hated enemy was the Mandalorian, and with those people's devastating defeat and losing any sole leadership, the Mando clans were increasingly making their way as bounty hunters as well. These once war enemies were now often engaged in skirmishes for credits. And over the centuries, these two peoples became synonymous with the deadly profession. This age also saw a sort of homecoming for the Elomen. One of the Zabrak ancient colonies had remained relatively remote, forgotten by the galactic community. 
and in isolation gave rise to a new species that descended from the Zabrak, known as the Elamin. The horned head is similar, but everything from the bone structure of the skull to the internal organs were different. And though now reconnected with the galaxy at large, the Elamin never ventured into much more than mining on world. But the colony on Dathomir would give rise to Zabrak that would change the course of galactic history. There are certain locations in the galaxy that have a natural charge of either dark side or light side energy. Dathomir was a world imbued with the dark energies that the Night Sisters drew on for their magics. This green energy being called Magical Ichor, Spirit Ichor, or the Waters of Life. By around 600 BBY, the rogue Jedi Knight Mother Ayla was learning to use her powers in the Force to channel this Ichor, dominating some of the other human colonists on this world. She created an all-female sect of Dathomirian witches, which over time split up into several clans. These clans would kidnap males to breed with, but at one point a group of pirates came to Dathomir with hopes of offloading some captured Zabrak colonists. There was a lot of speculation that humans were also genetic creations of some ancient aliens, and evidence that supports this is the fact that they can breed with both Twi'leks and Zabraks. Perhaps they were all created by the Rakata. When the witches saw the vitality and hardiness of the Zabrak males, the Night Sisters were quick to take them as mates. Using their proficiency in dark magics, there was no way for the captives to revolt, and they set up slave camps for the males to dwell in, where the females would only visit for purposes of intimidation, or the ritual called selection. In this trial by combat, the Zabrak would be forced to fight to the death with his own friends and even immediate family members. These human witches bred with Zabraks, giving rise to a new species called Dathomirians, as there was no native original species here. So these interbred beings were genetically distinct, and the expression of these Zabrak features differed in the males and females. The females still looked mostly human, with pale white skin and some hair but didn't have any horns. The males would retain their horns, but their skin color would now range from red, orange, and yellow. So from this point on, the next generation of Night Sisters were no longer human, but Dathomirian, also called Dathomirian Zabraks, and although that term usually has the connotation that you're referring to the males, technically Ventress and Talzin are both listed as Dathomirian Zabrax. Females that were born of these unions were raised as witches, and the males were just thrown back into the slave camp. But interestingly, the women would take on some of the Zabrak culture in the form of their tattoos. While the males had natural striping that was accented by the tattoos, many females chose to add some forms of tattoos as well. And so think about just how long this tradition stretches back, starting with the ancient tribal Zabrak of Iridonia and still seen not only in the colonists, but now adopted by these captors. When Mother Talzin rose to lead the Night Sisters, she returned to some of their old Zabrak mercenary roots, hiring out some of the sisters and their mailing servant warriors in order to protect some wealthy patrons. And again, we see that as soon as they open themselves up to the galaxy at large, the Sith are not far behind. Darth Sidious would be attracted to the immense dark side powers of Mother Talzin, convincing her that they should become allies, and that together they could rule the galaxy. But once he detected the young Maul, he kidnapped the boy and disappeared. This little red child was the biological son of Mother Talzin. I know it gets confusing because everybody calls each other brother or sister, and they all call her mother, but the canon lore is clear on this. So Maul's father would have passed an immense physical trial to mate with the mother of the clan. And of course, he would have some of her immense dark side power and the magics imbued as well. All things Sidious would hone into a killing machine. But Maul certainly wasn't the first Zabrak Sith. Though the Old Republic Zabrak Jedi were much more famous and powerful, there were several Sith throughout the Empire, and even in the later Brotherhood of Darkness. In fact, there was a group of three Zabrak apprentices that tried to ambush and kill Darth Bane in the Sith Academy on Korriban. Events like this made him realize that the weakness of the Sith was that several lesser Sith could team up and kill a greater Lord of the Dark Side. If only one being could be the complete master of darkness, the embodiment of it, and train a soul apprentice to one day replace him, if that apprentice could kill this incredibly powerful master on their own, they would be worthy of the mantle of the dark side, a practice that would come to be known as the Rule of Two. Getting away from the situation of three lesser Zabrak apprentices ambushing someone out of fear and jealousy. But Maul would become one of the defining characters of the final decades of the Republic. Thinking back to their ancient and intense hatred for the Mandalorians, it is poetic that Maul would manipulate his way to the throne of Mandalore, and drag their homeworld into a war that they would never recover from. Along his journey, he would be saved by his blood brother Savage Press, who not only passed his own intense trial to become Ventress's assassin, but would also be enhanced with the magics, the green ichor or spirit of life. With both him and Maul, we see how their biology could be altered with this sorcery, growing taller, getting denser muscles and bones, increasing their stamina, and even elongating their horns. 
With their natural Zabrak attributes of those two hearts, and that greater resistance to pain, these two would go on to use these traits to kill numerous Jedi in the final years of the Clone Wars. And it truly is an incredible testimony to Obi-Wan Kenobi's skills as a swordsman. This era also saw the bounty hunter Sugi. She was born on Iridonia, and was seen as a moral merc, sometimes not going out of her way to help people, but also never causing any problems or threatening innocence. She would take in her niece, Jazamari, who would become a bounty hunter during the time of the Galactic Civil War, and eventually become a valuable asset to the New Republic. Though the Dathomirian Zabrak force wielders of this era stole the show, there were of course the high-ranking Iridonian Jedi like Eeth Koth and Egan Kolar. We saw how Grievous would use his natural biological resistance to pain to be able to torture the Master even longer. Master Kolar would be killed during the attempted arrest of Supreme Chancellor Palpatine, but Koth would survive Order 66. He would marry a fellow Zabrak named Mira, who then gave birth to a daughter. Darth Vader would discover them just moments after Koth's child was born, killing the Master, and his Inquisitor kidnapped the Force-sensitive girl. Legends say that Master Shakti also survived Order 66, but when she was hunted down by Starkiller, Shakti's Padawan, Maurus Brood, fell to the dark side. What was really unique about her is that her horns had a unique deep red coloring. Now, something that isn't often fully grasped is that the final attack by Grievous, Dooku, and Sidious that destroyed the Night Sisters and killed Mother Talzin for good might have caused the Dathomirian Zabrak subspecies to go extinct. Only the males were spared, being off in their camps, but all of the witches were hunted down. So this mixed, human, Zabrak subspecies was believed to have come to an end. That was until Marin was discovered five years after the establishment of the Empire. She and a few other Night Sisters did survive and were hiding out in the rubble of their once powerful coven. And though we can't be certain, perhaps this subspecies still lives on. During the chaos of this post war era and into the Civil War, crime would flourish in many areas across the galaxy, often attracting Zabrak youth particularly, as they were stronger than most species in a fight and were actively targeted by gang leaders, as a couple powerful, horn headed beings in your crew had an especially intimidating look. Iridonia and all of the Zabrak colonies would feel the stranglehold of the Empire, who quickly undermined most of their industry and turned their population into a workforce to support the large stormtrooper garrisons that were springing up on all of their territory. That Zabrak spirit of independence and combativeness became a great asset to the Rebel Alliance. Much like their flocking to the Old Republic thousands of years ago, this occupation of Iridonia was not tolerated. Guerrilla-style tactics killed many Bucketheads in the streets of the Zabrak capital, and throughout the Civil War you would see numerous members of their species in Rebel uniform. With the fall of the Empire, they would become powerful allies of the New Republic. And then over a hundred years later, we get one last Zabrak that I want to mention, named Wolf Zazen. He was a Jedi Master during the Sith Imperial War and Second Imperial Civil War, fighting it out against Darth Krait's Galactic Empire. And so that's it for their biology and history, but you definitely want to hear these cool facts and behind the scenes stuff. In the Clone Wars, there's this confusing conversation. Under the impression that Darth Maul's homeworld was Iridonia. Dathomir is the planet where Maul was raised. Iridonia is where the rest of the males of the species dwell. The lore and canon and legends both say that they simply farmed the men, keeping them in their slave camps and breeding with them. What is said here seems to imply that the males were seen as actively being moved from Iridonia. You can make sense of this by simply stating that they were unsure of how it really worked, that the Night Sisters were one of the most secretive organizations in the galaxy, or that this did happen sometimes to sort of freshen up the ranks of men to pick from. This episode would make it the first time Iridonia was mentioned in canon, but it was first introduced in the novel Episode 1, Journal Darth Maul, released in the year 2000. And I wanted to point out that the early contact with the Duros traders is from a role-playing adventure game. It has several endings, some of which result in minor political tensions between these people, but one has a small-scale war erupting on Iridonia, which would make it the first interplanetary war that the Zabrak ever engaged in, predating the Great Sith War and the Mando issues. The Witches of Dathomir go back to 1994 with the novel The Courtship of Princess Leia, Though what's really interesting is that in 1985, the TV movie Ewoks The Battle for Endor had the sorceress Charl. She was retconned into being a Night Sister, and because this takes place long after the mating with the male Zabrak slaves, it might be right to consider her a Dathomirian Zabrak. This would make it so that from a certain point of view, the subspecies actually predates the official introduction of the Zabrak in the form of Eeth Koth in The Phantom Menace, which was released in 2001. So that's it for the Zabrak species. If you liked it, please hit the like button and comment your thoughts on this species or what videos you'd like to see next. All of that really helps the YouTube algorithm. Be sure to subscribe if you want to see more, and be sure to check out the description, where you can pick up cool Star Wars art or free audiobooks, learn how you can support this channel for free, or check out our Patreon and PayPal. For just $1, your name could be here. 
And special shout out to our $25 tier, Chris Garcia, Andrew Ban, Seraph Diaz, Cass Costello, and Carlos Velez. But most important of all, remember, if you ever have credits to burn, hire Zabrak and Mandalorian bounty hunters and give them opposing jobs. And just sit back and enjoy the carnage. And the Force will be with you. Always.